Welcome everybody. Uh, we're very happy to have Elizabeth Haley from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh on to do our talk today. Um, do you want to tell them a little bit about yourself, Beth, and then um, go ahead and do your presentation? Sure. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Beth. I usually go by Beth Haley. Um, I am a clinical audiologist at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and I also hold a research position at the VA hospital, also in Pittsburgh. Um, so I kind of split my time between clinic and research, which definitely has given me some interesting insight into this particular topic. Um, so just thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, if anyone does have any questions or comments throughout the talk, I typically find the easiest way to go about that is um, I'll have my little chat feature pulled up um, and just shoot a message that you do have a question and I'll pause when I'm able to and, and certainly open to any questions that you might have. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides with you. And I think you should be able to see my PowerPoint at this point. I'm just gonna pull that up. But do uh, let me know if, if you need me to just stop for a second, troubleshoot anything. Um, and for those of you that are using any kind of talk to texting or, or other type of closed captioning, just I'll give everyone a moment just to make sure that that's all working appropriately. And you know, before we, we dive into some of the specifics of this topic, um, again, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here, especially a little bit later in the day. Um, you know, I think that this is of course not the, the brightest and the happiest topic of, of all time, but I promise that I, I will do my best to focus on some of the, the things that we can do to really manage some of the difficulties that we are facing. And I really have just witnessed a lot of amazing collaborative efforts and other uh, support services and things that have, have really just inspired me, um, particularly over the last few months as there's been so many changes to, to the current setting with respect to COVID. Um, and I just, I just, it constantly just enhances my appreciation for this this field this profession and all of just the amazing individuals you know the people in attendance included um that that just put so much thought and consideration into the way that we work with our patients so i'm gonna go ahead and get started and i actually have a a kind of a rule of thumb um with presentations that i i rarely I guess I, in the past, would have said never, but I'm going to now have to say rarely uh, begin talks with quotes. I think it can be a little bit cheesy, but in this particular case, I think we maybe need a little, a little bit of inspiration and uh, to, to really think about this issue from a lighter and, and kind of what can we really do perspective. And I really liked this quote. I did a lot of searching around for, you know, inspirational quotes about this topic, about COVID in particular. Um, but this is actually from a physician who's done quite a bit of really fascinating work about communication with, with patients, bedside manner. Um, he works in a lot of different educational environments with um, residents and you know other medical students and he's just a really fascinating speaker he just really thinks about things from a different perspective and i love this quote because of course this is something that we already all are very aware of um, the importance of communication in any emergency situation certainly in a medical context as well but I think to really have it have it framed in, in this manner, just again, gives a lot of due diligence um, to what we've done as professionals throughout this time. And if you, you do have some interest in um, a little bit more of, of his background, I did include, and, and throughout the present, this presentation, there's gonna be a couple of videos that I've pulled directly from the internet. They should be embedded and work directly uh, with PowerPoint slides, um, which I'm happy to, to share with you. And it's fascinating because 
it was almost like this was meant to be. Um, when I when I watched this video that's attached at the bottom here, um, I did not realize, but this doctor actually has a hearing loss. Um, and so I think he puts some additional thought into the importance of communication in, in these types of times. So just, again, just really kudos to everyone and all the hard work that I know that, that you've already been doing. Um, objectives should have been included with the description of the course. Uh, I'm going to begin with just a very brief overview of some of the current statistics of um, actually adult and pediatric cases in the state of Pennsylvania, give you just a couple of resources that I really like in um, getting updated statistics on this issue. I don't want to focus too, too much on this because again, I think that I'd really like to give the most time um, and energy in this presentation to, you know, what can we really do to best manage our practice from an audiologic and, and hearing professional standpoint and not get too bogged down in these statistics. But it's, of course, always important to remember the serious nature of this issue and just how many people this has affected. Um, so from there, we'll move on and talk a little bit about some best practices for providing in-person, so in the clinic um, care during this pandemic. And then I definitely want to spend a good amount of time talking a little bit about some of the impacts of the physical and acoustic and other sensory barriers um, that are, are unfortunately inherent to things like appropriate use of masking, etc. Um, originally, when I was invited to, to do this talk, we had kind of as a state anyway, started to transition back into more in-person services. And while I do think that that is still the case and we're still overcoming a lot of these barriers, I did add a, an additional little section um, with some, some brief information and a couple of resources that talk about some um, virtual virtual care or just some some strategies to kind of make um, these these types of communications a little bit more more effective when it has to be done um, virtually. So one of my um, I guess favorite resources for getting up to date information about the current status of coronavirus in PA, and particularly I find this to be an amazing resource if you have interest specifically in pediatrics. Um, they they put a lot of information uh, in this Western PA COVID registry that gives you breaks breakdowns of all the different um, age ages of individuals with positive with either positive COVID cases or cases that have been hospitalized. Um, there's some really good information, solid, up to date, like I pulled information, for example, at the very top of the screen, you'll see um, total adult and pediatric cases in PA as of the, the fifth. So just a couple of days ago, this was updated. And so they're really trying to constantly um, give us additional information on, on this topic. Um, the Western PA COVID registry is actually created as a partnership between Children's Hospital um, Community Pediatrics. So some of this sort of ancillary sites in the area, um, many, of which provide things like uh, primary care services. So there's lots of pediatricians involved in contributing to this data um, and, and that sort of thing. And again, I just, I think the real time nature of this information is phenomenal and extremely important given current circumstances. Um, there's also some really, really phenomenal individuals that, that are working on this particular registry, one of which I wanted to highlight um, with some of her contact information as well, Dr. Megan Freeman, who I've begun to follow, um, kind of have a little bit of an intellectual crush on, on her for some of her work. She's really just a phenomenal young young physician. And I've also included down here, um, just like a, there are a couple of kind of live or embedded videos in this presentation. This is an example of an audio clip um, from a really interesting podcast that that she she gave about COVID-19. This was a podcast that was that was done back in March, but very much of this information is still highly relevant. Uh, she she talks quite a bit about 
um, the, the differences that we, we expect or predict between transmission and also just healthcare consequences of COVID-19 among adults versus children. Um, it's, it's really just something really, really neat to listen to um, and just really gives you a sense of some, of some of the background and some of the education that people who are working directly in, within our city and within our state have. And it, it's, it's really just inspiring. It's really aw, aw, awful. This podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh, this pod. So let's get into some of the specifics of how we might manage COVID-19 in person. So in person clinical visits, I think, you know, create kind of an additional buzz of of maybe stress or anxiety on professionals because we are really ultimately fundamentally and first and foremost concerned about safety among our patients. And so when we know that there is an inherent risk to being in a close closed environment um, with our patients, I think there's that inherent, you know, buzz of, of kind of stress and anxiety and what can we do about this. But really, a lot of the things that, that we can do and a lot of the ways that we can manage and, and slightly kind of tweak our practice are things that are, are actually, I feel, kind of intuitive and especially to communication professionals. You know, another, another really big take-home message, I think, to, to this talk and, and sort of a framework about how I think about, about this issue more generally is that really as communication professionals, we know a lot of this information. I might reorganize it or kind of try to reframe and reconsider this in a way that makes a little bit more sense given our current circumstances, but really that's just meant to empower all of you in doing things that you're already doing and that you're already considering. And I think you know these three most important considerations for physical safety and you know disease limiting disease transmission and that sort of thing these are just things that are are very obvious i think to a lot of us and are things that we may have even thought about to a a pretty large extent in the past, but I'm just gonna, again, give you a little bit of a more updated context um, for this. So these are specifically pulled from the Center for Disease Control, which is of course, you know, kind of goes without saying, I think at this point, the CDC and the World Health Organization are both phenomenal um, sources of, of resources of information for just more generally um, how to manage healthcare and disseminating healthcare in times of a pandemic. And so definitely encourage you to maybe once a week, couple couple times a month at least, revisit um, some of those, those websites. Again, a lot of the information are things that we already know, um, but I think it's just to a degree kind of empowering to know that what we are doing and our sort of natural instincts are accurate and really are are what the standard to which we should hold ourselves at this point. So the first thing, um, and I'll, I'll go through in the next several slides, I'll kind of break down some of these categories more specifically and give you some more audiologic focused examples. But of course, the first thing that we really need to be doing professionally right now is just reemphasizing the importance of disinfect- disinfecting disinfecting surfaces, disinfecting equipment, et cetera. Um, Whatever we can do to both do this consistently and also make sure that the manner in which we are disinfecting our clinics is as efficient as possible. Basically, disinfection is only going to work if we are actually accurately following the rules, so to speak, of how particular disinfectants work. So I'm gonna give a couple of just reminders about about some of those skills. Masking, I'm gonna also talk about quite a bit because we know of course that masks are extremely important during this time, but it also poses some difficulties, particularly from the type of work that we do as hearing healthcare professionals. 
Um, and, you know, I realize as well that some individuals in the audience that we have kind of a, a range here. So we have some people who might be working more clinically. We may have some research-based people. We have some education-based people who I might have to give a particular shout out to because I think doing that kind of in the field work right now must be just incredibly, incredibly taxing, but also I hope incredibly rewarding um, at this point. So a shout out to, to some of you, and I'm gonna just be giving a little bit um, more information about the consequences of things like physical barriers, like masking um, for individuals specifically, I'll focus a little bit on children as that is near and dear to my heart. Um, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on some of those, those communication barriers. And then finally, the commitment to hand hygiene, which is of course, you know, something that we, we need to think about on a regular daily basis. Um, that's not really something that I feel I need to review in depth, um, of course. But I, the first two points, I will definitely give quite a bit more information about moving forward. I'm gonna pause for a second in case anyone does have any questions at this point. But, you know, as I said, kind of starting off, all of this information is, is not probably going to be very new to you. A lot of it is intuitive. Um, it takes a very bright, considerate, maybe if it's fair to say, sometimes a little bit type A personality um, to make a great audiologist or to make a great hearing healthcare professional. It takes a person who is very considerate of how they carry themselves and each little action and behavior that they might exhibit throughout a clinic appointment, throughout, et cetera, their day. But I think what is really helpful framework for, you know, thinking about infection prevention and some of the tools that I'm going to be going over in a minute about disinfecting our clinic is just to remind ourselves that these are really just forming habits. So what kinds of things can we do to just enhance better habits and inform better habits, not only for ourselves, but for the office as a whole, for coworkers, for support professionals, if you are in a school environment, for students, for teachers, et cetera. So some of it is about, you know, changing our own personal habits. And then some of it is about modeling these habits for other individuals and just basically making that a, a new normal, a new typical standard um, to which we uphold ourselves. And so, you know, I did a little bit of research into what, what do we really need as individuals, um, kind of cognitively even, to change habits. And the first thing we really need is, is that it needs to be obvious <laughs> that we need to change the habit. And I don't think I need to convince anyone in attendance in a talk like this that it's quite obvious that, that we need to be doing things a little bit differently um, at, at this point in time for safety, for really the most important goal that we have, which is keeping patients and keeping people safe. How can we make it attractive? Well, I think that sort of lends itself to, you know, understanding how important the obvious becomes. So it's, a, it's an attractive thing to develop these, these better um, habits for managing our clinic, for keeping our cl clinics clean and safe, et cetera, because it's actually ultimately promoting safety and feelings of, you know, being considered and being kept safe in our patients. And I think that that is really the basis of, of the type of communications and interactions that we want to be having. So it's attractive from that standpoint. How can we make it easy? I'm going to be hopefully giving you a couple of tips that I've used or that some of the clinics that I work in have used um, that I find to be particularly helpful. And then, of course, how can we make it satisfying? This kind of relates, again, to the, the attractiveness of changing these habits is the fact that we know that we are making a legitimate impact on people's lives, not only by providing the services that we provide all the time, not just during a pandemic, but in understanding the, the kind of particular importance of providing these services during difficult times. A couple of tips for just changing habits in general. Um, I think actually the first one in some ways is my favorite. So just redefining what is a must, right? So we need to really just reconsider what is the basic, you know, bare minimum, so to speak, that we need to be doing. Because at this point in time, the bare minimum is 
really some pretty strict procedural changes um, that that just need to be accepted as absolute fact and, and an absolute change that just has to happen. There's just no other option than making some of the changes that I'm gonna be describing in a few minutes. We also kind of have to think a little bit about what types of behaviors, what types of thought processes, what types of routines kind of cue other behaviors. So for example, um, I think of this as being a time where there just is a lot of stress and anxiety and there's a lot, you know, happening and there's a lot changing from day to day. These are things that are influencing not just our work life, but our home life, our social life, our family life, spiritual life. All of those things are, are being affected right now. And unfortunately, being a person who I, I think this picture of the the young woman chewing on a pencil is like very apropos. Like, unfortunately, I'm a person whose bad habit is chewing on my my nails, which I was at least happy to see in doing a little research for this talk that about 20 to 30 percent of people struggle with this as a bad habit. Now, that habit specifically is something that, you know, needs to be addressed, for example, during this this type of pandemic situation. You know, it's a gross bad habit as it stands, but it needs to, things like that need to be particularly address, addressed right now. And so I think we need to kind of also remind ourselves that some of the bad, ha bad habits or some of the things that we might overlook in a more commonplace, you know, time where we're not in the middle of a pandemic are sometimes actually rooted in anxiety and trying to resolve anxiety. So we might be fidgeters. We might be people who, you know, kind of run from point A to point B, don't give ourselves enough time in between appointments to take a breath and relax and sort of process some of the emotions that, that come up when we work with patients, things like that. And so I think that it's almost particularly important right now to really be thinking about the types of cues and the types of things that maybe elicit some of those anxieties that need to feel rushed, et cetera, that make it easier to think, okay, I'm going to sort of skip cleaning, you know, disinfecting, cleaning the room this one time because it's just too time consuming and I've got back-to-back -back patients and, you know, I can certainly empathize and, and understand that that tendency to want to cut some of those corners but i think it's just in making making the point of recognizing that that cue creates an anxiety that creates the bad habit that is then perpetuated i think the the bright thing is that again you know these are small changes that we can make there are again a couple of kind of tips and hints that i'm going to give you to help you recognize when you are engaging in a routine like this and really recognize the moment when that like light goes off in your head of of that cue that you want to engage in something that is not going to be most beneficial for your patients right now or on the flip side if you're not trying to necessarily eradicate a bad habit, but if you're trying to promote a good habit, there's also some ways that we can sort of force ourselves to have these cues and initiate routines more easily. Um, of course, it definitely helps if we have things like rewards, if we kind of remind ourselves again of the importance of these issues. Um, I honestly think now more than ever, we talk about things like self-care and making sure as healthcare professionals that we're getting enough rest, et cetera. You know, self-care is kind of this big, you know, zeitgeisty like term at this point. But I actually think to some degree, not only does, does appropriate self-care, taking care of yourself, giving yourself, again, that time to breathe in, in the middle of appointments, not only is that gonna just make this, this marathon of a process, a little bit easier to manage, but it's going to actually make you more effective at managing the little, little detail changes that we now have to make um, on a, a daily, consistent, and regular basis. And I think self-care in particular is, is a nice thing to think about because it can kind of act as a reward. And I think that we should be, frankly, rewarding ourselves at this point in time, doing you know specific things that we enjoy taking a bath, you know, taking a nice walk, spending time, extra time with family, having, you know, the time to sit and watch a movie and be home. And I think it's really important, even in the context of changing these habits. So anytime you do feel 
like, oh, I've just been a little lazy today, or, you know, I just focused on myself. Remind yourself that there is that bigger picture that if you don't do that, it's going to be that much harder to make the kinds of necessary changes to your routine that you might need to in order to really ultimately benefit our patients. So have specific rewards. I mean, buy, buy yourself that pair of shoes that's sitting in your car if you have you know consistently done some of the things that you have defined as necessary in your job. I think that that is really important right now, more than ever. Um, it's also, I find really important to specifically write down these changes in routines. So hopefully having things like access to these PowerPoint slides, or there's a couple of resources attached at the end that give you some examples of almost items that you can use like a checklist. Um, I remember as a student, when I would do listening checks in our booth, I would check our audiometer and make sure it was working. There was always a very detailed checklist of each individual step that we might ask a student to follow. I had to initial every time. And I actually think for, for infection prevention, especially when you're first initiating a change in how you're managing infect, infection and disinfecting, um, actually writing it down, having a checklist, having visible reminders are some great examples of ways that we can just hold ourselves accountable, but then also, you know, remind ourselves how good of a job we are doing and that this isn't something, you know, that just comes always so intuitively. So some, some kind of rules for general disinfection. Um, again, I'm not gonna go too, too much in depth with this. I definitely defer you to the CDC website and the World Health Organization if you have specific questions about the types of disinfect disinfectants to use. Um, there's plenty of information about that on, on those websites. But, you know, in general, I think, let's say we are working this into a checklist type of a situation. I think that there are certain things that really need to be done consistently at the beginning and end of every day. And some would even argue in the middle, like kind of around lunchtime, we want to be doing things like actually vacuuming the booth. That's something that I didn't really think of, vacuuming the booth, vacuuming the clinic, um, taking care of, you know, some of the fabric surfaces really avoiding fabric surfaces as much as possible in clinics is, is your best bet. Um, but we don't often think about things like carpeting, curtains, fabric, things like that, but they need to be disinfected and kept clean consistently and on a regular basis, just like all other surfaces in our clinic. So I did want to make a point of, of bringing that up because that's definitely something that I can continue to develop better and better habits with. Um, there are spray disinfectants and things that can be used for not only, um, you know, more, more plastic or hard surfaces, but that can sometimes be used on both those and things like vacuums, car or excuse me, carpets. Um, so definitely can explore some of those options if you are in a situation where you're not in a hospital or, or a clinic or school that provides, you know, some of, some of that for you. Um, I also wanted to mention, I did a little bit of digging into some of the research about uh, ultraviolet lights and use for, for that in clinical spaces. And while UV lights actually are pretty well established as um, good, good disinfecting tools, I, I actually found quite a bit of information about um, damage that can be done to some of our audiologic equipment. Um, with UV lights. So I did just want to kind of highlight that because it's something that I think is being discussed, you know, more and more as we kind of start to think about more creative ways and more efficient ways to disinfect clinics. Um, just be cautious that you may, may want to really triple check that that's not something that would harm your equipment in any way. Um, sometimes it just involves moving the equipment out of the room. Sometimes, you know, the benefit of, of of the ease of using something like UV light ends up just being outweighed by the detriment of having to then move your equipment. So something to consider. But again, these are things, you know, really thorough wipe down of the clinic, consideration of fabric spaces, et cetera, needs to be really be done at a minimum beginning and end of day. Again, I think in a best case scenario, it would be done at least three times a day. 
after every single patient visit, that's what we're going to kind of be focusing on a little bit more so moving forward. Um, that's when really all surfaces that have been touched by the patient, family, etc., really need to be thoroughly wiped down. Um, there's a slide that I have coming up in just a minute that highlights a few of these hot spots. So just a couple areas to kind of think about. Um, I showed picture. I'm going to show you some pictures of different clinics, audiology clinics, to. Uh, let me actually just, I'm gonna just skip ahead to that actually. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures and some examples of these hotspots. Um, but you know, the more that I think about it, the more that I kind of think we, when we talk about habit forming, you know, just making it easy, making it obvious. Um, maybe if you are, you know, in your own clinic, if you have some, some role in managing infection um, in whatever environment you're in, maybe you should consider having stickers or things located in, um, in, in certain spaces within the clinic that could be kind of hot spots for, for uh, passing along bodily fluids, infection, et cetera. Um, just, just something to you know, consider. So a couple of the really, really important and key, key areas that I wanted to talk about specific to audiology are of course our booth. <laughs> so I think the booth is the one that we really need to be as conscientious about as humanly possible because in our, our booths, there's a couple of things that make them particularly um, susceptible to infection transmission, unfortunately. And the first is just the closeness of the space. So we know that distancing is a very important piece of managing, um, managing in this, this pandemic. And, you know, I, I of course, over here Googled um, a bunch of different images and, and plans for different audiology clinics. And gosh, like some of these spaces are just beautiful and huge. And that's not always the case. I mean, we are sometimes feeling a little bit, I think on top of our patients already, depending on what situation or environment you're working in. And I think it's just really, really extra important to remember that that booth space, it's very, very difficult to distance appropriately. And so that is the time that masks really have to be worn as effectively as possible, covering the entire face, wrapping around the ears, et cetera, um, you know, as much as possible. Limiting family members in the booth, if you're in an environment where, you know, you are working maybe with children or you're working with caregivers, try to really keep it to just the patient in the booth as much as possible. Um, the other reason being that, you know, there's quite a bit of information that's been released at this point from different manufacturers of, of our booth spaces. And depending on the specifics of your booth, um, it can actually take quite, quite a while for air, air to stagnant air to, um, to, to work its way out of the booth and exchange with fresh and healthy and clean air. Certainly this happens much, much more slowly than would happen in a typical room. And in part, you know, from the audiology side of things, that's been a positive and that's kind of partly, partly the, the way that we make booth soundproof is by limiting that air exchange and really cutting down on the background noise from filtering and, and things that need to occur to exchange that air. But in a situation like now with a pandemic, it's really important that we recognize that that is a limitation of our booths. And what's actually recommended is that you, after every individual, you disinfect the booth, you actually shut the door, and then you leave that area vacant for depending on your booth and the specifics of the ventilation, ventilation system that you have, which you can contact specific, um, you know, manufacturers to get more information about, but depending on the specifics, you may really need to leave that booth shut, you know, with the door shut for 20 minutes, half an hour, some even recommend as much as an, an hour to really allow for the flow of, of air to circulate. So something really important to consider. Um, Another, another aspect, things like waiting rooms, check-in, check-out areas, narrow hallways, these would certainly be something that's, that's a bigger consideration in an environment like I tend to work in, like a hospital environment. 
But my goodness, I can also think of many, many times in school where, you know, young people are relatively on top of each other in, in hallways, there's closed stairwell spaces. If you're in a situation where there is a, you know, there is in-person learning happening or hybrid learning, there's probably going to be a lot of transitioning between classrooms happening potentially at the same time if you're working on a system where there's specific periods set throughout the day. So just things to think about, you know, if there are ways to limit that, if there are ways to have people maybe staggering appointment times coming at different times, so there's not a lot of people in the waiting room, so that there's not, you know, several people leaving at the same time as several people coming in, as much as, as you can allow for that, I, I think it really will be to the benefit of your clinic and the benefit of, you know, your patients to allow for that. I'm just gonna make sure, I think my chat is open, but definitely shout out if someone does have a question at this point, I don't wanna miss anyone there. So another few weak, weak links in our clinic, um, one that, you know, particularly lately I've given a lot of thought to are actually our boom microphones. And I think, you know, I, I had an, an originally in this, this pandemic put so much thought and so much consideration into the equipment that we're using with our patients. But in a way, I almost kind of, you know, was so focused on what we need to do to limit the effects of, of things touching our patients and transmission from patient to patient, that it's almost easy to forget a little bit that we are like human beings with saliva and germs and that we can just as easily transmit, um, transmit various things from our body to other surfaces, to other individuals. And so it's really important that we think about, you know, things like the microphones that we use. We're literally speaking and, you know, not to be gross, but like spitting a little bit into those microphones, right? And so considering that if you work in a clinic with multiple people, maybe because it's, it's really quite difficult to really wipe down boom microphones, the actual microphone portion, maybe we really need to consider people having their own individual um, boom mics, things like that. Uh, that w is a huge point of potential transmission from person to person. So something to really put some thought into. Um, of course, you know, as I've already kind of stated, I think a lot of us have, have probably already put quite a, quite a significant amount of thought into things like headphones and other diagnostic equipment. That certainly can be a point of transmission because we're potentially, if you're testing 10 people a day, you've now had 10 different exposures with one set of headphones. Um, this is something that I had thought about in the past a little bit being that I do do some newborn hearing screenings in our neonatal intensive care unit. And there's actually several articles that I found throughout the years that have identified things like newborn hearing screen screening, excuse me, equipment as one point within the hospital, one kind of point of breakdown in which we can transmit infection from patient to patient. Because if you think about it, at least in, you know, a, maybe a well baby nursery, that piece of equipment may be touching essentially every single child born in that hospital. Um, so keeping equipment like that, mobile equipment, this is again really apropos if you work in an educational environment, anything mobile that is, is being transferred from person to person, something to really, really consider. Um, keep infectant, disinfectant wipes on that equipment right there, right? you know, right in view, like, so that you almost cannot miss it and you can't forget to do it. And then, of course, finally, things like hearing, well, not finally, but in terms of patient equipment, things like hearing aids, um, other devices, assistive technology, really important to remind ourselves that that, that is a little little uh, germ, germ potential carrier. Um, and so, you really want to think cautiously about, well, you know, do, do I have to be the person that's maybe touching this, this hearing aid or making a replacement on tubing, for example? If, it's, if you're working with a family or an individual that's quite capable of doing things like that, changing their own batteries, et cetera, for the current time, it's really best to let them do that as much as possible. And this may also be a nice opportunity for us to step back a little bit more um, and, and be a little bit more empowering to our patients. I know I personally, as a bit of a people-pleasing type 
type of a, a person tend to just want to want to grab things and, and help and fix and solve the problem for the person. But I do feel that this is a time that has really, you know, challenged me to empower my patients to make some of these changements, changements, changes, excuse me, and adjustments um, as much as they can and really just to talk them through it. And we are more than capable of doing that. So stepping back and kind of letting them do that will also be good for infection prevention. Um, a couple of just other areas, some of which I've, I've already mentioned, but things like door handles, things like chair handles, all the little buttons on our audiometers. Um, I know, you know, I'm sure many of you if working with audiometers that have really held up for many, many years. You can even physically see where some of the buttons are worn. We're touching these things like hundreds, possibly thousands of times a day if you're working in a really busy clinic with multiple people. Um, and so those surfaces definitely, you know, need to be wiped down as much, as much as possible. Also just little tools and kind of containers and things for, for our tools. So for example, you know, we use these little like tackle box looking containers for hearing aid supplies, for tympanometry tips, even though our tips and all of that are disposable in most scenarios, which is a, a great thing for infection prevention. Just consider that if you pull a tip out, put it in the patient's ear, and then maybe you have the wrong size, which certainly happens in the pediatric world, you have to get another one. Now you've transmitted whatever was on that gross ear tip to the, the container that is now holding all of your nice clean equipment. So things to really just put a little bit of extra thought into. And again, that comes to that, like just reforming your habits and, and kind of forcing yourself to to engage in new cues and and rethink your behavior on a really kind of micro basis micro level at this point a couple of other things that are again you know kind of re related to audiology and specific to clinical practice but maybe just a step beyond that. Um, phones are one thing I think about a lot, kind of like boom mics. We're basically just talking and spitting right into a phone. So we need to really be conscientious about wiping those down. Um, cell phones are actually pretty icky. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, we're, we're using them all the time in all kinds of scenarios. It's being held right up to our face. We're getting makeup, whatever our hands are touching are on there. Whatever is in the bottom of your purse is probably on, on your phone. And there was actually a study by an audiologist, AU Bang, Bankitis, I believe is how you pronounce her name. I've seen her name all over the place. Um, she's phenomenal. I just have not had the chance to meet her personally, um, but I've, I've heard nothing but good things about her. There's actually a blog, um, of hers posted in the additional resources that, that has spoken to some different COVID practices. But she was involved in a research study that basically showed that streptococcus um, bacteria is all over people's phones. So just remember to wipe down the phone as much as possible, certainly throughout the day um, when you're seeing, seeing patients. Things like lunchrooms, um, I know at least at UPMC, we get weekly email updates, actually daily email updates um, about you know, some of these hotspots and some of the ways that we can just be doing better as kind of a team to limit infection and you know, limit both ourselves getting sick and our patients getting sick. And lunchrooms, break rooms, spaces where you basically have to take off things like masks in order to eat. Um, they're, they're an area that deserves a little bit of an extra attention um, paid to disinfection because we just can't, you know, let, let ourselves be that point person who's, who's transmitting something to our coworkers, for example. No one wants to be that person. <laughs> um, toys is another really important thing. We use toys all the time. Um, I think about just how much harder my job has become because I can't blow bubbles for a kid when I need to get DPOEs on them. So we need to really think about finding other toys that are plastic, that are easy to be wiped down, um, that are maybe potentially disposable in some cases. Really, I, I recommend just not even having cloth, toys, stuffed animals, plushies at all in the clinic right now. They really technically are, are not something to have in the clinic anyway, um, because there's, it's just very difficult to stay on top of keeping those things washed appropriately and sanitized appropriately. So 
putting that stuff away unless it's something that can just be given to an individual and that's the one individual that you know plays with it and that's it so like some of the little plush koala bears and things that we get from cochlear give it to your patient they take it home that's fine but keeping those things around the clinic as adorable as they are and as much as i find them just adorable as well not the best idea right now um Definitely think about setting up an area for contaminated toys, making sure that there is some system that, that you can kind of track when things are clean or dirty. I had an example that I passed by just a second ago, visible reminders. Um, so actually at UPMC, we're using um, these clean and dirty sliders to the left here, um, or just outside of our booth so that we know as soon as you, you know, finish with the patient, you, you move that slider to dirty. If you need to go type of a report quickly, et cetera, everyone knows the status of that booth and it can be appropriately cleaned before bringing the next person into the booth. Even little signs like having masks, um, the appropriate, you know, visual visualizations of how to wear masks is really important. Number one, it's a reminder for us. Number two, I think it, it reminds our patients and it's kind of a reference point. So if you have a patient who's, unfortunately, we, we've experienced some, I'm sure, that are not so excited about the use of masks, it's kind of taking the onus off of you and saying, look, this is just systemically what needs to happen right now. There's signs everywhere. You have to put your mask on appropriately. And certainly we did not personally in our clinics make the, the decision to go the route of having something that brings a little levity, levity to the situation. Um, but actually I, I did find out that the little dirty clean sliders that we use even for the booths are actually, um, were originally intended for uh, dishwashers. And I, I thought that was kind of cool. So I looked into other options for like clean and dirty dishwashers. And there's some really funny ones there. I gave you the Yoda example. Um, you know, if, if you are working in the kind of environment with kids that you can bring a little levity to this situation, I encourage you to do that. I think there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. We're still recognizing the serious nature of it by having, having these visual reminders, but if we can keep the clinic a, a happier, brighter place, it's important to do that as well as much as possible. I just wanted to note as well on the, um, this slide about cleaning toys, there's another link to a nice video from the CDC that gives some more information about that. Supervision was something that I wanted to bring up quickly, um, just because I think a lot of people in the audience may have the opportunity to work with students. It's certainly one of my favorite um, parts about being an audiologist. And I just, I love working with students and I love working really closely with students. And I found myself in this exact picture, basically many, many times. And I, have made kind of the self realization that actually when I'm around students and when I'm supervising, that's one of the, those cues, that's one of those times that I sometimes really need to really stop and think to myself, like, are you really being consistent with masking? Are you staying as much at a distance as possible? This is another great example of a time that I think we can try to really step back and hopefully if you do have a student placed with you or someone that you are supervising to kind of let let them figure out their own way a little bit and then provide supportive feedback from a distance. But I think it is very easy if, if you're not explicitly talking about you know, ways to modify your practice with students and with people that you're supervising, it's incredibly easy to be Accidental, accidentally on top of each other. And I, I definitely, that's an area that I want to continue to work on myself. Um, I think talking about these expectations explicitly with students is important. This is another great time to use things like checklists so that everyone is kind of on the same page here. I'm not gonna really review this, but I wanted to make sure um, that, again, that this kind of provided a nice overview of some resources. So another couple of videos here about taking on, or putting on and taking off, which I did not know. I knew it was called donning to put equipment on, but apparently it's doffing to take it off. I did not know that. Um, here's just some, some specifics about the best way to do that, because again, not only do we want to be consistent in changing some of these habits, but we want to make sure that we're doing it as effectively as possible. And there are ways to increase the effectiveness of things like 
protective equipment. So something again to consider. Now I'm going to spend the you know, really the end end of our talk, the last few minutes that we have here, talking about some of the barriers to communication with specifically with children with hearing impairment, although much of this applies to adults. And this is, of course, really important because I found a range of statistics, but for the most part, statistics really suggest that listening activities, particularly in educational environments, take up about 72% of a young person's day. And that is a lot of the day. And that's when we're talking about things that are active based listening. So we're listening all the time is the reality. And I just really, you know, want to remind ourselves of that and remind ourselves that all of the things listed above the fact that we're now at a distance from people that there's degraded speech that we don't have lip reading cues that young people so hard of hearing people that we know sometimes already need to need to have access to socialization to develop appropriate social behaviors now we're not getting as much of that practice in young people and that you know we can't do a lot of the things hand on hands on that we might have done in the past there's not going to maybe be as much access to things like gesturing, you know, young people are going to almost be sometimes forced into more auditory behaviors and listening in things like the educational setting than ever before. Um, so these barriers are something that we need to overcome if we can. So this kind of brings us to a new form of the masking dilemma, right? We now know that masks, as important as they are in protecting us from infection and preventing infection, they present some difficulties for communication professionals. And none of these are a surprise to you all, I'm sure. Um, we need to remind people that, and, and when I say people, I mean not just our patients, but caregivers, other health professionals, that this is a really important Thing. And that probably across the board, even patients that don't have hearing loss are going to be faced with greater difficulties with listening. Essentially, masks act like a filter for high frequencies. They just filter out, some studies say, much of the, you know, a lot of the information above 3,000 hertz is degraded. Some even have said as low as 2,000 hertz, but it's unquestionable that they, they provide muffled speech, speech that's quieter um, and dampened and in ways that's not natural. So not evenly across our frequency spectrum. And of course, as I mentioned, we don't get the visual, the benefit of visual cues when we're using masks. This is, you know, something, again, not just influencing individuals with hearing loss, but this is a problem for young people with auditory processing disorders. This is a problem for people with dementia. It's a problem for healthcare providers who are maybe both talking to one another through masks. Um, it's something that definitely needs, needs to be considered. So as I mentioned, you know, we, we have particular concern for high frequencies, but because we're we're cutting off high frequencies, which we know to be really important in things like perception of S's and TH's and those really high frequency, um, you know, fricatives, sonorants, like those types of sounds are particularly affected. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't impact the way that we we perceive vowels and things as well. It does. Um, it has to do more so with the ratio at which low and high frequency sounds are now perceptible. And that can be extremely, extremely difficult when you're considering an individual with a hearing loss on top of, you know, these, these other consequences. So something that I, I think, you know, is very important, and I, I, this is actually important not just during a pandemic situation, but something that's really already an essential component in school-based services are functional listening evaluations. And so I, I say, you know, whenever I get a chance to an educational audiologist or a speech pathologist or a person working really in the field with young people, that what I do in a controlled Soundproof environment is is great and all. It's it's diagnostically an important step in the process, but we need to know what's going on in the real world just as much, if not sometimes more, than what's going on in our sound sound booths. And so, considering doing more functional listening evaluations is is something we should I think be doing all the time, but maybe particularly now. 
I think many of us probably at this point in our careers have developed some great strategies for communication, some communication tips to give to our patients, families, teachers, et cetera. I've just provided some that you know are are not a surprise to you. I'm sure will will not be new to you, um, but just as a resource if if you do need a good good list. And I did want to just speak for a minute about some of the greater specifics of particular masks and difficulties introduced by them. One that's been brought up a lot are the is this the communicator, the safe and clear mask. And I think that this can be a really good benefit, but I don't think that we should rely on that only. So another um, tip for communication is to consider things like a speech to text app. That's something you can use directly in the clinic. It's something that young people even, so in an educational system would be pretty familiar with and comfortable with, because the reality is no matter what mask we use across all different types of masks, there's pretty good data at this point that we're seeing an average decrease of approximately 12 decibels, which is a lot. <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time on this. I know we're running low on time, and I wanted to, to present you, you know, with, with this information, but give you the caveat of this is very early in development. Um, this was provided to me by a researcher that I work with um, who was happy for me to share this, but there needs to be research done as to whether or not it makes sense to have, for example, a mask program for a child with hearing loss, so a program on their hearing aid that they go into if they're having difficulty with masking. But I thought that this was some interesting information for those of you out there who do work very closely with hearing aids. Some points points to consider and some ways that you might want to consider modifying your hearing aid fittings if you've come across an individual who is expressing to you, I'm having a lot of trouble with, with masks. Um, of course, the best thing that we can do, since we just have to admit that at this point, we know that we have we have and should be distancing our speaker and hearing aid users from three to now six feet. Um, we have to remember that using hearing assistive technology whenever possible is pretty much always going to be the best best route, the best way to go. Another thing I just wanted to address was the comfort aspect. So a couple of options for making mask wearing a little more comfortable for our kids with hearing loss. I also work with a lot of kids who have attention difficulties and certainly can, can do more on my end to consider more comfortable solutions for those kids. Um, and Again, being that things have unfortunately been changing in the direction of maybe becoming less and less in person over the next few months, um, I did want to provide you again with just a little information about successful ways to have virtual visits. For more information about this topic, I just highlighted some of the, the basics here. You can actually visit Audiology Online, and there are a couple of great um, talks on audi audi excuse me, Audiology Online about COVID and about this topic. This is one that I did really enjoy and specifically goes through um, virtual visits, e-audiology. So something to consider that I did want to add in given that things are constantly kind of changing currently in our state. And, you know, finally, I just wanted to spend one more moment to really just hammer home and, and really just show my appreciation and make a point of telling you all how much I really appreciate the fact that there is so much thought and consideration being put into this as a, a topic. I think healthcare professionals now more than ever are starting to be realized for how conscientious and how much, you know, what due diligence it really does take to keep people safe and to really work through a crisis like this. Um, and I just wanted to say that I've recognized that in so many of the communication professionals that I've worked with and that, you know, there's going to be an aspect of social and emotional health that we now need to manage. We're going to be probably additionally exhausted. I miss my family. I'm sure many of you, you know, are facing things in your own personal lives. If you have children dealing with maybe being a kindergarten teacher now, in addition to being an audiologist, I think the best thing that we can do as a field and the best way that I can support you all and one and we can support one another is to just be very open and honest that most everyone and 45 percent in a recent survey are saying that coronavirus is having a negative impact on mental health and that a very significant number 19 percent is quite significant 
um, is that it's having a major impact. And so this is something that just is, is a fact. It's occurring in our profession. It's occurring in all, across most professions. Our patients are dealing with this. And so we just want to stick with the facts, minimize that, that tendency to kind of think about the worst case scenarios and the fear, always continue to check in with ourselves. So we must always return to ourselves, take those few moments in between appointments, make sure that you're managing your stress okay. Um, you know, the struggle is real, basically. And just think about the fact that so many individuals have reported this as a difficulty. Yes, infection prevention, wiping down surfaces, all of the things I focused on at the beginning of the talk are extremely important, but mental health is just as an important part, if not sometimes an even more important part of safety and of public health and our response to, to, to situations like this um, as anything. And so just do keep that in mind and be easy on yourselves, take some breaks, make sure that you are really taking care of yourself and just know that you are appreciated, I think now more than ever, um, especially as people who really recognize the importance of communication during such a difficult time. So I hope that this has been helpful. There are tons of references out there at this point, which I think just shows you how amazing you know, people, people are and have come together in this field to create these resources. They're solid resources, and a lot of them are up to date and, and updated very frequently. And there's just been a lot of great work done in this area in such a short amount of time. Um, so here are some that I really appreciate and really like. And that is what I have for you today. But I, I apologize. I know I went a couple of minutes over. But if you have any questions, um, certainly I'm going to share my slides with you. And I can share my contact information. Feel free to reach out. And I can hang on for a minute if people have questions. Thank you so much. Beth, great job. Um, do you want to type your contact information into the chat? Oh, sure. Good idea. And then, yeah. And then people would be able to get that. And do you have a link to your PowerPoint? That you would be able to put in the chat or I know about a link me I can probably get it out to whoever wants it that might be that might be the easiest for me if that's okay well thank you everyone for coming today um is there a code word I don't know oh do, do maybe for CEUs do they mean maybe I I don't know um Tara are you still on Hey, Jen, I'm here. Do we have an exit code or are we just because they registered <laughs> going to be? Fantastic question. Um, I think Aaron is saying it is HE12. AT12. Nope, here, I'll put, no, 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 hang on, I'll put it in the chat. <clears throat> I see. Uh, Judith I, Sexton, I see your comment. I will personally send you a copy of, of that PowerPoint, but yes, I believe Jen offered graciously to send this to anyone who, who wants it as well. This was great information. Again, um, you did a great job and thank you so much. Um, it's kind of funny because you came through when I was at Pitt as an instructor and boy, does that make me feel old? <laughs> It's already happening to me. I'm already old. I know it's scary, isn't it? But thank you so much. And again, whoever wants a copy, um, uh, my my email is jcraig at patentpittsburgh.net. And I can put that in the chat also. Okay, thanks a lot. And um, we'll see so much you. For having me. <laughs>